Jessica Wongso was born in 1988 in Jakarta, Indonesia, into an extremely wealthy family. She was the youngest of three children of Imelda and Winardi Wongso. Raised in the lap of luxury, Jessica was spoiled to the fullest. Her family owned a major company involved in importing plastic. Indeed, they were among the largest plastic distributors in Indonesia. Many referred to her father as the Plastic King. In a country like Indonesia, where the majority of the population lives in poverty with an average income of about $4 a day, Jessica was among the fortunate few in the upper echelons of wealth. She always had everything she wanted, and then some. In 2005, Jessica's parents moved to Sydney, Australia, as it was the main market for their business. They bought a beautiful home in the suburban harbour area of Double Bay, one of Sydney's most expensive residential areas. Just a small plot of land there could cost millions of dollars. Jessica's father purchased two adjacent plots for more spacious living. However, for some reason, Jessica did not move to Australia with her parents and siblings. She stayed back in Jakarta to complete her high school education. Her family employed dozens of staff and servants to care for Jessica during this time. From a young age, Jessica was passionate about video games and particularly gifted in painting. She could sit and draw for hours on end. This passion led Jessica to decide to study graphic design. After finishing high school in 2007, she moved to Sydney to live with her family and enrolled at the Billy Blue College of Design. Despite her siblings being in Australia, they lived separate lives and Jessica rarely saw them. She began her university life and made friends with many people. Her college friends described Jessica as a lively, silly girl who was always entertaining and brought joy to everyone around her. During this time, Jessica met another Indonesian student at the university named Mirna Salihin. Like Jessica, Mirna came from a super wealthy family in Jakarta. Her kata Edi Salimin was also a successful businessman. Mirna had a twin sister named Sandy Salihin, and her longtime boyfriend was Arief, who was also studying in Australia at Melbourne, whereas Mirna was in Sydney. Mirna and Jessica quickly became close friends as they both belonged to the upper class, shared a love for design, and were independent, modern women with strong personalities. Despite their similarities, Jessica and Mirna had their differences. If Jessica was outspoken and always the life of the party, Mirna was shy and modest. While Jessica loved to be the center of attention at every Gutha ring, Mirna preferred simplicity and a low-key life. Moreover, unlike a Jessica, Mirna's family was very warm and close-knit. The university years were perhaps the most memorable for everyone. Mirna and Jessica, too, often went out with two other classmates, Hani and Vera, who were also international students from wealthy families in Jakarta. Time flew, and eventually graduation day arrived. After graduation, Mirna returned to Jakarta with her boyfriend, while Jessica chose to stay in Australia with her family. In June 2015, Mirna visited Sydney for a holiday. She planned to meet her university friends and spend some time exploring the beautiful harbour city. Mirna got back in touch with Jessica and they arranged to have dinner together. Four years had passed since their graduation with each leading their own lives. While Mirna enjoyed a fulfilled, happy life with her fiancé, they were newly engaged and preparing for a dream wedding. Jessica's life was less smooth. She worked in New South Wales and had a long-term boyfriend named Patrick, but their relationship was fraught with arguments. Jessica claimed Patrick used prohibited substances and was prone to violence. Jessica seemed to be dealing with a lot of mental issues, becoming increasingly depressed and negative. She was no longer the cheerful, lively Jessica from before. Myrna was worried for her friend. Being upright and straightforward, Myrna advised Jessica to decisively break up with Patrick. However, from Jessica's accounts, it was clear Patrick was not a decent man and had a detrimental effect on Jessica. Yet, Myrna could never have anticipated Jessica's reaction afterwards. She became silent and did not respond to anything Myrna said.
After Mirna finished speaking, Jessica abruptly stood up from the dining table and left Mirna alone in the restaurant without a word of goodbye. That day, Mirna learned a costly lesson. Never advise someone to marry or to divorce. The friendship between Mirna and Jessica, already fading since graduation, now seemed irreparably fractured. Mirna told Arif that she would only meet Jessica if other friends were present. She didn't feel comfortable seeing Jessica alone. Arif said she shouldn't dwell too much on it. After all, Jessica lived in Sydney and they were in Jakarta. They no longer shared many mutual friends. In November 2015, five months after an awkward encounter with Jessica in Sydney, Myrna held her fairy tale wedding with Arif in Bali. The couple enjoyed a beautiful ceremony, inviting all their friends except Jessica. Myrna, beautiful, intelligent, and wealthy, had a wonderful husband and was adored by everyone. Her life seemed to be covered in rose petals. Meanwhile, in a distant land, Jessica's life was spiraling downward. In August 2015, she crashed her car into a nursing home at 2 a.m. while intoxicated. Her Audi A3 smashed through a brick wall right next to the sleeping quarters of the elderly. Fortunately, no one was injured, and Jessica was taken to the hospital for treatment. The accident woke everyone in the nursing home and caused chaos. Jessica sustained only minor injuries, but her poor Audi was severely damaged. This was not the first time in 2015 that Jessica had been in an ambulance. Throughout the year, she had been hospitalized five times as she no longer wanted to live. Every few months, the police and ambulance had to visit Jessica's house, but each time her boyfriend arrived just in time. By November, Patrick had had enough. He approached the police to request a restraining order to keep Jessica away. She had terrorized Patrick with thousands of phone messages, threatening to kill both of them if he left her. Jessica also continuously contacted, harassing Patrick's friends and family. Patrick expressed his exhaustion and concern for his and his family's safety. Meanwhile, Jessica was drowning in alcohol and exhibiting irresponsible behavior at work, which eventually led to her termination. Understandably, Jessica was furious. She lost her boyfriend, her job, and seemed to be losing herself. She sent threatening messages to kill her manager and the manager's mother. She warned the manager that she knew precisely how to kill someone. With nothing left for her in Sydney, Jessica decided to return to Jakarta. Everyone believed Jessica wanted to return home to start anew. However, her decision stemmed from a much darker motive. In early December 2015, Jessica formed a WhatsApp group with Hani and Mirna. Hani was also living in Jakarta. Mirna was still upset and the two hadn't spoken since their last encounter. Therefore, Mirna didn't respond immediately to Jessica's messages. But after Jessica pleaded, and with Hani's involvement too, Mirna reluctantly agreed to meet. Jessica eagerly messaged in the group chat that she would treat them to drinks and take care of the reservations. She asked what everyone wanted to drink. Myrna said she liked Vietnamese iced coffee, but would order for herself when she arrived. They agreed to meet at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, January 6, 2016, at a luxurious cafe named Oliver Coffee in the Grand Indonesia Shopping Center. When the appointed day arrived, Jessica was there from 3.30 p.m., a full 90 minutes early. She wandered around surveying her surroundings. Actually, Jessica was scrutinizing the location of the cameras inside the cafe. Eventually, she chose table number 54, a secretive spot next to the wall, well hidden from view. At exactly 4.15 p.m., Jessica returned with three shopping bags from the park and body shop. She said she had bought three bars of soap to give to her friends. After placing the shopping bags on the table, Jessica slightly shifted them to ensure they effectively blocked the camera's view. Moments later, she approached the bar and ordered three drinks, two cocktails and one Vietnamese iced coffee, paying in advance. Once the server delivered the beverages, Jessica made sure they were all placed behind the shopping bags. After the server left, Jessica shifted her seat. 
Though the camera footage was blurry, Jessica's hand movements were noticeable. It appeared she was adding something to the coffee. After finishing, Jessica stashed the bags behind the chair and returned to her seat. When Myrna and Honey arrived at the cafe at 5.15 p.m., 15 minutes later than planned, their drinks had already been sitting on the table for over 45 minutes. Upon seeing them, Jessica stood up to greet them. Myrna's body language revealed her discomfort and awkwardness around Jessica. Seated between Jessica and Hani, Myrna was quickly prompted by Jessica to try the coffee. Unaware, Myrna complied, but after just one sip, she realized something was terribly wrong. She waved her hands frantically in front of her face, telling Hani that the coffee tasted horrific. The drink remained nearly untouched, but that single sip was enough to seal Myrna's fate. Less than a minute later, Myrna's head snapped back in her final movement. She began to vomit, foam at the mouth and convulse. She collapsed to the ground, all within a few minutes. Chaos ensued. Servers and the manager rushed over to help. Hani tried desperately to wake Myrna, but she was completely unconscious. The manager ordered the staff to call an ambulance and bring oxygen tanks. Curious patrons turned their heads in horror while Hani screamed and wept uncontrollably. Only Jessica appeared eerily calm and emotionless. The restaurant manager later told the police that her initial thought was that the girl was having an epileptic seizure. However, Jessica glared at her and accused, What did you guys put in the coffee? The manager was perplexed and offended, wondering why this woman would accuse them of tampering with the drink. Her suspicion led her to instruct her staff to seal the coffee cup as evidence. If Jessica hadn't spoken up, perhaps the most crucial evidence of the case might have been discarded. Hani called Aryev to tell him that Mirna was having a seizure and foaming at the mouth. Needless to say, Aryev was panic-stricken. He rushed to the hospital, but by the time he arrived, Mirna had passed away. The doctors had done all they could, but it was too late. Arif was shattered by the cruel reality. They had just married two months prior. He had kissed his wife goodbye that afternoon, their future filled with plans and dreams. Only hours before, he had everything, and now he had nothing. Mirna Salihin died at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, January 6, 2016. Mirna's family and friends were in shock. They couldn't comprehend how a healthy young woman in the prime of her life could suddenly die. Just two months after attending her dream wedding and wishing the couple a long, happy life, the same group was now gathered around her coffin in mourning. The sudden death of the beautiful young woman, coupled with the mysteries surrounding it, raised suspicions. At the funeral, Jessica's strange behavior was noticeable. She seemed irritated and did not shed a single tear. Jessica's odd demeanor fueled much speculation. Why was she insistent on Myrna drinking the coffee? Why had she ordered it 45 minutes before their arrival? Why choose a table hidden from the first security camera's view, with the second camera perfectly obstructed by three shopping bags? Tragically, events unfolded too quickly and unexpectedly, so no one searched Jessica that day. Surveillance footage showed that while everyone else was panicking and trying to help Myrna, Jessica stood aloof in the background, looking around and scratching her thigh. Toxicologists theorized that the itchiness on Jessica's hand could have been caused by direct contact with cyanide. However, when asked to hand over her trousers for examination, Jessica claimed she had discarded them because Myrna had vomited on them. But in reality, Jessica never approached Myrna after she was poisoned. She just stood back, devoid of any emotion, not doing anything to assist. Nevertheless, it's hard to believe that a friend, a young woman of the upper class and education like Jessica, could be capable of such a heinous act. The manager handed Myrna's coffee back to the police for investigation. Three days later, the test results were released. 
The police confirmed that the coffee contained a lethal amount of cyanide. Indonesia, being predominantly Muslim, has religious beliefs that discourage autopsy. In criminal cases, the police require the family's consent to perform one. Initially, Mirna's family was reluctant to allow the autopsy, since they did not want her body to be disturbed. However, the investigators worked diligently to convince the family, assuring them that the procedure would be conducted with the utmost care. Ultimately, Mirna's family agreed to allow the police to take some samples, but they did not consent to a full autopsy. On the evening of Saturday, January 9th, three days after Mirna's death, the autopsy was carried out and the findings were concluded the following morning. The results showed that Mirna's stomach had bled and contained a small amount of cyanide. However, the toxicology tests revealed no presence of cyanide in other parts of her body. Thanks to the prudent decision of the manager to have the staff seal the coffee cup, the police had solid evidence. The murder weapon was a coffee cup laced with cyanide. The question arose, how did Jessica obtain cyanide? Acquiring cyanide legally is not easy, but many believed that Jessica, being highly intelligent, might have purchased it on the black market. Nevertheless, the police found no evidence of Jessica ever acquiring cyanide. The case shook the entire nation of Indonesia and garnered significant public interest and media attention. The country followed the case day by day, discussing it as if it were a blockbuster crime thriller. From that point on, numerous unfounded rumors began to spread. After security camera footage rapidly spread on social media, most people suspected Jessica. But the question remained, why? What was her motive? Some speculated that Jessica harbored unrequited feelings for Mirna, deciding on revenge after learning that Mirna had married Arief. Others suggested Jessica acted out of anger for not being invited to the wedding and seeing Mirna becoming closer to Hani and Vera. Arief, Mirna's husband, theorized that Jessica was upset because Mirna had advised her to break up with her boyfriend. Meanwhile, Sandy, Mirna's sister, believed that Jessica killed Mirna out of jealousy. She was envious of everything Mirna had that she didn't, not just wealth, but a loving husband, a happy family, and close friends in Jakarta. However, all these were mere speculations. The true motive behind Jessica's actions might only be known to her. Indonesian police reached out to the Australian authorities to access Jessica's criminal record while she lived in Australia. The Australian laws against capital punishment meant the police agreed to hand over the files on the condition that Jessica would not face the death penalty if found guilty. Indonesian authorities agreed. Jessica's record in Australia was far from clean. She was listed in 13 police reports for offences such as threatening others' lives, driving under the influence and having her ex-boyfriend apply for a restraining order against her. On June 15, 2016, six months after Mirna's death, the trial of the century commenced at the Central Jakarta Court. Jessica showed no signs of remorse or sadness. In fact, she was the complete opposite. If one were to only look at the footage, they might think this woman had just won the jackpot rather than being on trial for murder. Jessica appeared radiant, smiling broadly throughout the session and proudly waving at the press. Clearly, Jessica relished being the center of attention. Throughout the trial, Jessica consistently responded with a calm demeanor and smiled at the judge. She seemed very confident she would be acquitted. Her wealthy family had hired more than 15 of Indonesia's best lawyers to defend their daughter. The defense team argued that cyanide was not found in Myrna's liver, lungs, or urine. Only a small amount of cyanide was detected in her stomach, which they suggested could have been produced by the body post-mortem. They also argued that the exact cause of death could only be determined by a full autopsy, whereas the examiners had only taken tissue and fluid samples for study, not performing a comprehensive 
autopsy. Jessica's lawyers suggested that her death could have been due to an undiagnosed illness. The police, however, had never proven that Jessica possessed cyanide. On October 5, 2016, the courtroom was packed with spectators, and the nation held its breath as the jury delivered its final verdict. Ultimately, Jessica was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years in prison. The courtroom erupted in applause and sighs of relief because of the agreement with Australian police, so Jessica escaped the death penalty by firing squad. For the average Indonesian citizens observing the lives of the ultra-rich like Jessica and Myrna, it became evident that even the wealthy could be unhappy and have their problems. Following the case, Vietnamese iced coffee seemingly became the city's most popular beverage, found in cafes all over. However, it also carried with it a dark tale no one wished to remember.